Hello, I'm Robin Cole and welcome to the Satellite Image Deep Learning Podcast. In this episode, I caught up with Nicholas Gonthier to learn about the Flare Land Cover Mapping Challenge. In this challenge, 20 centimeter resolution drone imagery was used to create high quality annotations. This data was paired with a time series of medium resolution Sentinel-2 images to create a rich multi-dimensional data set. Participants in the challenge were able to surpass the baseline solution by 10 points in the target metric, representing a significant step forward in land cover classification capabilities. The data set is now being expanded to cover a larger area and incorporate additional imaging modalities, which have been shown to improve performance on this task. Nicholas also provided important context about the objectives of the organization running this challenge, such as the need to balance model performance with processing costs. This was a fascinating conversation, and I hope you enjoy this episode. If you are watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe, as this will really help to grow the channel and reach a wider audience. Thank you. Hi, Nicholas. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Robin. Thank you for welcoming me. It's a pleasure. Let's begin with where you work and what you do. Okay. Uh, so I'm a project manager in the innovation team uh, at IGN. So IGN is a, a national uh, agency, non-profit one uh, in France, working about uh, geographical and forestry information. Mm -hmm. And so we are uh, creating, creating a lot of data for different uh, policy, uh, public policy and policymakers. Uh, mainly about uh, agricultural information, forestry, ecological, and land use. Mm -hmm. and right. Personally, I'm I'm more working about yeah, deep learning for observation and change detection. Fantastic! That's a nice introduction to the background. Uh, and you've been involved in the Flare Challenge. Do you mind giving us the background to that? Yeah, so uh, in fact, we create uh, these very high quality data sets uh, that we've called uh, FLARE about uh, land cover uh, semantic segmentation uh, in order to help us at Hygiene to produce uh, land cover uh, products, especially um, products that can be uh, deployed at um, country scale. So it's now been used in the, the production pipeline uh, at the Institute in order to have a very precise land cover. And for that, we have annotated a lot of different uh, images from different regions of France in order to have broad diversity. Mm -hmm. And uh, we then train supervised model on this uh, data mm -hmm. uh, in order to help us to produce uh, inf um, this kind of uh, mapping of the territory. Right. And we then decided to open uh, both the data sets and the code and the model uh, in order to be able to reproduce. And finally, we organized um, a two different challenge uh, in order to um, encourage community, morally uh, computer vision and remote sensing community to work on our problem. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So I think the first version of the competition and the data set was 2022, and then there was a, another version a year or two later. What changed between those two versions? Um, between the two versions, um, we change, uh, we add a new modality, uh, what we call new modality in the second part of the data set. Uh, so the first uh, data set is composed of uh, very high resolution images, high level images uh, that have been uh, acquired by IGN. Uh, so it's a 20 pixel um, ground, uh, ground level pixel with uh, annotation made by, made by the hand and that have been verified. So it's very high quality that we need to train supervised model. Mm -hmm. And on the second data set, we also add for each of the patch from these images, uh, Sentinel-2 time series from the um, same zone uh, in order to bring more information about, uh, for instance, phenology of uh, vegetation or to be able to distinguish some different classes that we can have between, for instance, bare soil and agricultural because the behavior will not be the same during the year. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the zone we provide are even wider than the uh, small hourly uh, zone in order to have also have context information. Maybe right. you can know that if around you have kind of sea, you can uh, think that this is uh, more uh, sand than something else. I think mm -hmm. that right. So a high resolution snapshot and then a time series yes. at lower resolution to understand temporal signatures. Exactly. Very interesting. And how do you exploit both of those? Uh, image sequences in a model? Uh, so we propose the baseline in this case to do this kind of um, fusion of uh, information. So we have uh, first uh, kind of classical units, uh, semantic segmentation model for dealing with the uh, high resolution IR images. 
And then we use what's called uh, a UTA. So it's kind of units that are modified in order to have a temporal attention system in order to compress and uh, in the clever way, the temporal information from the time series. And mm -hmm. we inject this information at different points in the uh, main branch of the unit. And we supervised the both branches, so the one with the uh, aerial part and the uh, time series part, with the high resolution annotation we have uh, provided. So right, that's the best line we proposed. And in the second challenge, people try to do different kind of uh, fusion elements, uh, try to uh, remove some, uh, for instance, cloudy images, or try to only use very few images, and or also try to calibrate the aerial images based on the time series. Mm -hmm. And everything, a lot of thing, things have been uh, tried. Fantastic. And how do people do with their their approaches versus the baseline? Oh, the people bring. I think if you remember well, it was like something like uh, almost ten uh, points in uh, mean average precision in total. So it was uh, interesting uh, things, and we will try to use them as much as possible. Uh, in the second challenge, we also add uh, an extra thing: the fact that. Uh, we require um, user, uh, sorry, participant, to not uh, use too much uh, computer power. In, because, mm. in fact, in the first challenge, we realized that uh, some of the best methods were very cost uh, costly. And as we need to be able to pro uh, provide data at a country scale, so like very, uh, very huge uh, amount of data, we need to have efficient solution. Mm -hmm. um, so that's also a second thing we, we add in the, in the contest. Interesting. And how did you specify the limitation there? Was it one we GPU specified limited or? like no? It's like on yeah, on one GPU to have the uh, something like no more than twice the inference time from the baseline model. Right. So okay, so you set the hardware and said this is the expectations yes. on how quickly it should on. Run. Okay. Very interesting. Okay. I'm curious. Did you do any kind of investigation to see what was the most significant features for particular classes? Because you could imagine something like urban areas wouldn't actually matter to have the time series, but other like vegetation might. Oh, so we remember that the vegetation earned a lot uh, about the um, time series, but also uh, the urban area, we were surprised about that. For instance, building by using Sentinel, uh, Sentinel-2 time series, get uh, three points uh, EO uh, improvement. So classes that have been the most improved are more the bare soil uh, class, in fact which should be more easily uh, distinguished from uh, agricultural land, for instance. And also right. vineyards have been also quite uh, improved by uh, these uh, multimodal uh, models. Very interesting. So there's some confused classes and having the time series actually helps to separate those yeah. two. Okay, yeah, that makes, that makes sense. And uh, I understand there's also a third uh, stage in the, in the data set and competition. So um, uh, no, uh, not in the competition, but in fact, we, uh, so this uh, providing this, um, no, sorry, I'll start again. Uh, do, uh, organizing the competition uh, forces us to have very clear baseline, to have something proponentable, and to be able to open both uh, the data set, but also the code to be able to run and train model. And then we also uh, decided to uh, publish in an AI conference on NeurIPS last year as uh, this data set in order to uh, encourage uh, academic people to work on our uh, problems that on our issue we have at IGN. And uh, for now, we are trying to think about uh, really creating a new version of the data sets. Yes, with uh, three times more uh, aerial images with very high resolution. So for now, we have something like 800 kilometers squares uh, annotated, and we are aiming uh, 2,500 kilometers uh, annotating. Mm -hmm. And we will also add uh, more um, modality or extra data, so like uh, Sentinel-2 information, but also Sentinel-1 uh, data on the same uh, area. Right. So I understand expanding the modalities, the number of sites, presumably. Yes. And the intuition is that just with a larger data set, you'll get better, better models. And better performance. Exactly, yeah. That's what yeah. we expect. And also, and so, yeah, and we also released um, in the, after the challenge was released, the baseline model with the weights so people can use them in order to uh, do their own things. So they can fine tune them, they can use them as evaluation, as are 
initialization for training or some different things. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we will and we and we will do the same with the next version of the of the dataset for sure. Fantastic. I'd like to just talk a little bit about the process of creating these data sets. Do you mind just at yeah. high level saying how you go about it, how you select where to sample data, that kind of thing? Um, so uh, the idea was to have very uh, very diverse data sets. So we tried to sample data. So it's only on the uh, metropolitan uh, areas of the, in the parts of France that is Europe, because France also have a lot of different um, highlands in the Caribbean, for instance, or in the Indian Ocean. But and we will work on that uh, later for sure. Uh, and uh, then what we so we select a zone with different uh, landscape with big cities, small cities, uh, with mountains and things like that. And we also iterate on that. And for instance, the next version of the set will have more diverse uh, region again. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also this, and then we uh, make people annotating the different uh, classes. So land covers up to class. And we also have um, uh, oh, sorry, a validation system. That means that then a second person, sometime, not always, but sometime at random, We'll check if annotations are correct or not. And if it's not the case, we will go again on the annotation, not to improve the quality of it. Because we mm -hmm. aim a uh, um, quality of 95% uh, uh, accuracy on the human uh, annotation. Right. So, so yeah. Have... So it, it was very uh, time consuming and, in fact, costly. But it's worth it because we were able to, to get a good uh, AI model then. Yeah. Two questions on the uh, selection. Did you go for like an equal weighting on all the different classes, or did you say this class is really hard, this or this location is hard? Let's have more data for that. What's the strategy there? At the beginning, we didn't do that like that. That means well, we we more looking at the different uh, region of France because as we are a kind of mapping agency, we already know where are the different, let's say, uh, bioclimatic region in France, uh, where we can find small city, more uh, dense urban area. Mm -hmm. And uh, then on the next version of the data set, we will focus specifically on, so on some classes that are uh, harder for the model, yes. Okay. So we, yeah. we are able to say. And for instance, on the second challenge from Flair, we decided to emphasize more about the validation because it was uh, one of the hardest things to, to distinguish. Mm -hmm. And for instance, we decided to put more vegetation class uh, in the test set in order to select models that are reviewable on these classes. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. And in terms of determining which classes are hard, did you see that it was always the same for the human and the model, which classes were the hardest? Or there are some classes that are easy for a model because it has a time series, but hard for humans, eh? Mm, try to think about it. I think one of the classes that is... Uh, so, some of the hardest class for uh, machine, uh, so for uh, machine are the class like uh, brushwood and plumbland, and which are maybe easier for human. Uh, also, I think it also depends on uh, which kind of uh, photo interpreter you are, because at Hygiene, we're very high experts are able to distinguish different kinds of trees, which is still a very hard task for machine, for instance. Mm. Um, but for land cover, I think it will be more about for machine, especially about the difference between bare soil, agricultural land, uh, things like that. Right. Okay. Because presumably a human has additional context. They know yes, the exactly. area. They have a map, something like that. Okay. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. You mentioned about adding more modalities. I think you mentioned Sentinel 1. Uh, I presume that's because that's widely available. But is there kind of a wish list of modalities that you would like to include in the future? Uh, we also think about adding uh, what we can call uh, uh, kind of uh, spot images, so it's like also satellite images, but at one meter uh, per pixel. Mm -hmm. So it's like an intermediate between a sentinel at 10 meter and aerial images at uh, 20 centimeters uh, resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, we also think about adding like um, LiDAR uh, information mm -hmm. because uh, for now, so iGen, we're also working on uh, LiDAR acquisition for different uh, land uh, description. So for instance, mm -hmm. like forestry mainly, but not only, also mm -hmm. um, flow estimation. Uh, and so we think that adding this kind of information like LiDAR, which is a high resolution LiDAR, like 10 points per meter square, could be interesting to add on the same region and to see if I can able to learn models that can deal with different modality 
mm-hmm. or try to leverage the different information in the different modality. Yeah, that's a good point to segue back to the model side of it. As you add modalities, you add number of channels. Does that indicate that different kinds of models will be successful as you kind of increase the dimensionality in that way? Uh, what we observe is the fact that, for instance, on a well, let's say on the simplest case. Uh, so in our case, uh, for the RL information, we have uh, f- what we call five channel. We have RGB, infrared, and also um, elevation model mm. that we compute from photogrammetry based on the RL images. And we have uh, shown that uh, adding the infrared increases the, the performance, and also adding elevation can increase performance. So our clue is the fact that adding more uh, modality, if you do it on the right way, uh, can uh, bring better performance, yes. Okay, so that's even without changing the architecture of the model that is just showing that these features have useful information. But I think like for time series in the, uh, on the Flare dataset baseline we released, we didn't add the um, uh, time series as an extra channel, but like more like, uh, context information that will be processed by an auxiliary branch and then is injected in the uh, feature space of the main model. Mm-hmm. We did more like that. You mentioned briefly to me offline that uh, you saw the benefits of using transformer models. Yeah, uh, on the first challenge, we saw that the uh, best um, performance was about, uh, was obtained with uh, mainly based on a vision transformer which like we can see in the other field of computer vision, like in medical case, natural images. Uh, so it was not a surprise, but it's interesting to see that some people were able to train this model on our data sets and to get very good results. So now we're trying to uh, incorporate that in our own pipeline and also to release a pre-trained model based on a vision transformer. One of the main uh, problems is the fact that it's sometimes more costly. And as I mentioned before, as we are trying to produce a large scale data, it could be very uh, a, a clear problem for us. And mm-hmm. on the other hand, uh, some of the problems is the fact, the fact that uh, vision transformers are based on patches from the images. Sometimes you can have kind of border effect on, this, on the patches. That could be uh, a problem for us also, and we try to, to resolve. So maybe more model-like uh, hierarchical uh, vision transformer uh, could be a solution. Fascinating stuff. Well, thanks so much for this uh, introduction to the the dataset series and uh, the accompanying modeling work. You mentioned that the third dataset will be out. Do you have a, a date in mind for that? Uh, not yet, but I think it will be in uh, 2025. Okay, so early early next year, hopefully. Good stuff. Uh, if people want to follow along updates, both yourself and uh, the activities at IGN, which is the best platform? Uh, it depends for the um, more like the innovation part and all the AI model. We are hosting a few data sets and models on a gig face. We have a page from iGen that we can share. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for all the production parts, uh, it's the iGen website uh, where we propose all the information I mentioned about, about biodiversity, about uh, forestry, or agricultural information that are produced by uh, all the institutes. Okay, fantastic. I'll put the links in the, the show notes. Well, once again, Nicholas, thanks for joining me and I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you, and you too. Bye. Bye.